Hello everybody and welcome to Spindle TV. I hope you all are doing well this evening. Um, I jumped in a little bit early. Uh, hopefully you're doing well. Uh, last week we had, um, I had someone ask me if I could turn up my volume. So I'd like you all to uh, let me know. I brought the mic a little bit closer to me tonight. Uh, let me know if my volume is okay. Uh, they said it was a little low last week. So let me know if I, uh, my volume's okay. If not, I can jack it up uh, and everything. Um, okay. Yes, so uh, for Greg Cheney, yes, I'm gonna be covering kind of all different types of aspects of models, how they combine and things. Uh, we're gonna look at, you know, uh, I know the title says Vetric Aspire, but some of the stuff, you know, when it comes to combining models, it can, that can be done in desktop and pro as well. It's not just all Aspire. Uh, when it comes to making models, of course, you know, building models from scratch or photos, which we're gonna kind of cover a little bit on, uh, that's that's Aspire and stuff. But most of the stuff we're gonna talk about can is gonna be relevant to all the, all the software. Uh, but yes, I'm going to cover things about like uh, how the order uh, of the models affect the outcome and stuff and what, you know, the levels are and how they help us and all. Um, and uh, let's see here. Uh, Greg also says, uh, I have a lot of issues with models sticking up or sticking down and not changing when I click on the different options. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we're going to talk about the combined modes uh, and everything with models and also the order uh, that they get built in and stuff and how that affects one versus the other and stuff uh, and hopefully some of the things uh, that we cover tonight uh, will answer some of your questions right uh, so uh, hopefully everything's going well hey just a quick shout out to everybody I know not everybody's here right now so I'll say this a few times throughout I want to thank everyone that jumped in and uh, ordered the Father's Day projects uh, that I put out there available and all uh, kind of to help raise uh, some uh, money to offset some costs and stuff for our upcoming adventures with our new building and stuff uh, on the Father's Day projects uh, we were able to raise about a thousand dollars and uh, which is phenomenal. So that money has gotten put into a savings. Uh, so hopefully, I don't know if it'll generate interest. It's a low amount, but um, uh, that that was great. Uh, so that'll you know definitely go towards the building and stuff. Uh, like I said, uh, that building I think um with the concrete and everything, it's a little over twenty five thousand. But uh, but yeah, man, no great support. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, you know I've got other model packages uh, that are available for Fourth of July and also. Uh, for those of you that um, uh, that might be interested in a 2A model, the Second Amendment type model, I got something like that. I try to be, so as a businessman and a carver, um, I, I try to make models and stuff that would sell. Uh, but also at the same time, I, I some of them I'm worried about putting out there because I don't want to trigger somebody, right? Uh, or offend someone like if they're against guns or what have you. Uh, so I'll show that one and everything and uh, but I don't want to get into any political discussions or anything like that because uh, politics has no place in business uh, and all and uh, I don't know maybe you guys will like those as well uh, I posted them in our Facebook group our digital woodcarver owners Facebook group and we had uh, quite a few people order from there of those 4th of July models and our 2A model and stuff um, but uh, yeah pretty cool stuff um, so I'll show you that and everything while we're talking about models and combining models and stuff and stuff. Uh, so you'll kind of get to see them as we kind of work with them and stuff. All right. So all that being said, let's go ahead and uh, why waste any more time? Let's get started. So I keep looking over my shoulder because my monitor is back here. I need to one day make it where it's in front of me. So I'm looking straight ahead. But let's uh, jump over to channel three channel three there we go and let's get me down in the left bottom corner there we go now I do have Vetric Aspire uh, open right now 
I do have Vetric Aspire open right now. Uh, and again, some a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about uh, is gonna just involve clip art models. Uh, and, and, and we're gonna talk about how they're, you know, different types of models with the different software, Vetric VCarb, Desktop Pro, and Aspire. Uh, many of you Vetric are all Vetric owners, and so you know, or you may know, that with Desktop and Pro, we can import multiple .v3m models. That's our basic clip art that kind of comes with uh, our, our software packages and that we can buy off of design and make and things. Uh, we can import multiples of those uh, to create sceneries and stuff. But third-party model files, uh, those would be STLs, OBJs, .x, 3DS, uh, PRJs, uh, those third-party model files, basically any file that's not a .v3m, uh, we can, in desktop and pro, we can only import one third-party model file per project. Uh, and uh, in Aspire, we can import multiples of V3M or third-party model files. So what that means is if you uh, are in desktop or pro and you're looking and you're online and you're looking to buy models and things, uh, if they give you the option of, uh, if they say, what type of file format do you want, uh, .v3m, if that's an option, that's absolutely the first option you want to go with. Then from there, you can, you know, uh, third-party model files, STLs are good, OBJs are, are good, uh, and that's usually the kind of the two that I work with, OBJ and STLs and stuff, but we can import, uh, you know, a few other formats and all. But if you have the option, like if you're on designandmake.com or you, maybe you're on Etsy and they actually have the option, if you have the option of a .v3m, that's what you want. Uh, uh, absolutely, because if I bought, let's say a scenery, a deer, trees, mountains, and a log cabin, and I had them all three as a, you know, a .v3m file, or all four, then I could import all four of those miles and build my little scenery with my deer and cabin and mountains in the background and trees and stuff. But if those were STL models and I was in desktop or pro, I would only be able to import the deer or the cabin or the mountain or the trees, but not all of them. Now there are some workarounds that people have done. Uh, they, they, you know, they've, they've saved projects and uh, reopen them and import another file. There's some workarounds. I don't know exactly what those workarounds are, uh, but I'm sure on YouTube, God, I'm sure there's someone that made a video on how to import multiple third-party model files, you know, if you searched it up. Uh, but I have heard or seen some people mention workarounds that they've done to get more than one third-party model file into their desktop and pro. I don't know what all those workarounds are and all, so we're not going to even talk about that too much. But when we are, uh, let's say we're creating models from scratch, what we want to do is, and well, not necessarily when we're creating models, even when we're working with models. If I know that I'm going to be working with a 3D model in my project, then I want to work in a very high resolution. So if I click right now, if I click create uh, job setup and everything, in my modeling resolution in the job setup over here on the left, I really only have three options, uh, which is the very high, standard, and uh, high. Uh, and th that has to do with, or that re that has to do with the number of pixels or points uh, that it takes to create the 3D preview. And that makes a big deal. So at the very least, I want a very high resolution if that's the only three options that I'm gonna work with. At the very least, that's what I want with my 3D models because if we're in a standard or a high and we have a low pixels to create that 3D model, that pixelation in the model will translate to the quality of the finished cut, okay? So we want a very high resolution, okay? The higher, the better. Now, if I were to have hold my shift key down, and this is for Desktop Pro and Aspire, if I were to hold my shift key down before I click on uh, create a new file, then I have two additional options. I have extremely high and maximum. Extremely high works with about 8 million pixels and maximum is uh, 16 million pixels. Now very, very, very rarely 
do you need to be in maximum unless you're creating models and you want kind of a high poly count and, and you know kind of a high definition model. Uh, generally, a good you know uh, a good option is uh, the extremely high. I like working with the extremely high if I'm working with models and everything, but I have to understand that I am at the sacrifice or the mercy of the quality of the actual model that I purchased or that I you know that someone sent to me or what have you. The quality of that model, the resolution of that model cannot be changed. So if I have a low resolution model and I import it into my extremely high settings on my in my software it's not going to change the resolution of that model. That model is a low resolution. It's going to stay. It doesn't affect it. Um, but if I'm working with a high resolution uh, model and everything, and I have it extremely high, then I'm going to be kind of consistent in there and everything uh, when I'm working with it. Now, if I'm creating models, then I absolutely, if I have Aspire and I'm creating models, I absolutely want to be in the extremely high or the maximum. I typically design in maximum but I have to understand that when I'm looking at my previews and things like that, that 50 times slower, that means that from our standard resolution of 1 million pixels, it's going to be 50 times slower generating that 3D preview and, and calculations and things like that. So I have to be aware of that. And it's a sacrifice that I'm making for a high resolution model. Um, so we can't change the resolution when we buy a model. We hope that when we're on CG Trader or uh, or, or, or uh, you know, uh, design and make usually are high end. You know, they're pretty high definition already. But you know, if we're on Etsy or something and we're buying models, uh, we're hoping that the creator of that model made it in high resolution and not a low poly count. Uh, you know, where we see all the triangulations and everything. And uh, I'll import some samples of uh, high resolution versus low resolution and things. Um, and so. Uh, First and foremost, in our job setups and stuff, uh, at the very minimum, when you know you're working with a model, you want the very high resolution, the standard, you know, the, the maximum of the three main options we get. But um, if you uh, wish, like if you're creating models or if you're working with models uh, that, uh, that you know are kind of high end, we can go with those two higher options. And I like working, when I know I'm working with models, I work in the two higher options. Uh, and uh, and I, I just have to know that if I do buy a model and I don't make it myself, uh, that I need to really you know, look at that model and the description of that model or whatever the person provides me and make sure that I'm getting a high quality model. Because I bought some models that have been low resolution and they're just, uh, for better, better lack of words, they're crap you know excuse my French but uh, and uh, I can't clean them up much no matter how much smoothing I try to do and things like that I'm not going to get the results that I want so we have different resolutions in our job setup and they play a role because that number of pixels is going to translate to the quality of the finished cut um, and things so uh, now when you're doing 2d stuff you know V carve and all that uh, the very high resolution I use as a default which is kind of the standard, um, but uh, it really doesn't play a role. It's only our modeling resolution that it affects. Now I'm gonna set up a job here uh, that's 24 by 24 by an inch and a half, and I'm gonna click uh, my very high resolution, and we can't go back and change a resolution. So once I do that, once I've, I've set up my job and everything, and I start kind of you know, drawing and, and, and things in there or what have you, if I go, oh shoot, I'm halfway through this model that I've created and I didn't, you know, I didn't change my setting properly, we can't go back. Because when we go back into our job setup, uh, here for an instance, let's go, let's say we were at our standard or our, our very high and everything. Well, when I go back into my job setup, uh, my other two options are gone, extremely and maximum, they're gone, they're not there. They're only going to be visible at the time of the job setup. So, you know, take that however you want. I'm just trying to, that's kind of our start because we have to, we know we're going to be working with models. So our job setup is going to be important and that modeling resolution is important. Okay. So, uh, you know, 
I, I typically, if I know I'm working with models, when I am setting up my job, uh, I'm gonna hold my shift key down, click on create a new file, and that'll give me my other two options, and I'll either be in extremely high or maximum, either one of those two. Uh, when I'm working with kind of a high-end model that you know that I might be putting out there uh, for sale or something like that, then I typically work in maximum. I want the highest resolution um, and stuff. Uh, and so that's that. Okay. Now, from here, uh, you know, our software comes with a variety of clip art. Now, for those of you that are new to Vetric and everything, your Vetric V-Card desktop comes with about 1500 US dollars worth of 3D models. It's about 349, 350 different models and clip art and things. Uh, our VCar Pro comes with about $2,000 worth of uh, 3D models and clip art built into it. And our Vetric Aspire comes with about $5,000 worth of models built into it, about 1500 models. The VCar Pro is about 475 or a little bit more than that now. They, they add more models as time goes on and stuff. Um, but we have a wide variety of models that we can work with, but we can also go to places like designandmake.com. That's where we can get our Vetric type models, those V3Ms and stuff. But there's also places like uh, waved, uh, 3dwave.com, cgtrader.com, you know, Etsy, you know, we can find models and things like that. So there's a lot of different sites, uh, and I've only named like two of many, uh, but there's a lot of different places we can get them. Now, uh, Typically in the Vetric software, there are th usually there's kind of three sets of the same model uh, and they're just drag and drop uh, and stuff. And we have a model that is uh, basically kind of by itself, uh, meaning that uh, it's kind of raised. So if we go into our 3D view here, it's kind of raised. Uh, our second option is a model in a dish. Oh, I have the hiccups. Uh, where it's kind of in a dip or a dish. And then our third option is the model with kind of this choppy uh, boundary around it uh, and things like that. So and it's still kind of a dish, but it's got this almost kind of like, a, for better uh, lack of term, it's kind of a seashell board, you know. Uh, there's a term for it, but it's got kind of this uh, scattered border around it and everything. And so... Typically, we have those three different styles. It just depends on what we're trying to do and things. Uh, now, I'm going to go ahead and uh, delete the two uh, shell type models here. And let's uh, delete that one. All right. And let's focus in on uh, this model here. Now, whether I'm in Desktop Pro or Aspire, I can uh, blend or, or build models together. And this is what, uh, um, this is, uh, what uh, Greg was talking about is, is, is how do, you know, what's the best way to build models and how do they combine? Now, I'm either dragging and dropping a model or opening a model uh, that I, if it's a V3M, it just opens right in. If it's a third-party model file, then I'm importing that model. Now, uh, keep in mind, we'll talk about importing and orientating a model in just a moment. But with a model here, um, when I'm just dragging and dropping, I'm kind of building them. And they have in their properties, in the model's properties, they're at a set kind of combined mode already. Uh, most of them are add. Some of them are subtract and stuff like that, but you know, typically, I, I'd say most of them are in an add mode. Now add, when we're adding one model to another, basically it's when you're in add, it's you're adding your second model or your top model to the model that's below it. So just like building a house, we always start with our foundation up, okay? And so when we, when we combine one model with another and we add that model, then that means that model is going to take on the shape of whatever model is underneath it. And so if I were to take and go back into my clip art here and let's uh, grab a model that's pretty obvious. Uh, let's go into decorative 
and let's grab a model that would be very obvious here uh, we'll just grab this one if I were to take this model and drop it on here okay onto my other model if I look at it in the 3d view and we look at it from the side let's turn it around here that Florida leaf model has taken on the shape of the model that's underneath it uh, and so if we turn off the fleur de leaf for a moment uh, we have the model that's underneath it has got you know this curve and waves and everything here and so that Florida leaf is taking on what's underneath it uh, basically I always attribute it to like a bed sheet if we took a sheet and draped it over a car that sheet is going to just conform and create the shape of the car that it's covering now when we come into our combine modes we have add subtract merge low and multiply now if I subtract that model from the other that means I am bringing down that fleur de leaf and I'm creating that fleur de leaf in a negative space or negative uh, layout and I'm subtracting that from the model that's underneath it so I'm kind of creating that floor to leaf divot if you will in that model that was underneath it and things now if I merge that floor to leaf model then it's gonna blend those two models together and so let's zoom out it's going to blend those models together now at this point when I'm merging the two models uh, I need to decide okay is one supposed to be in front of the other uh, do I want it behind it like it is or kind of even with it whatever it may be uh, and if we go and look at this in a straight up fashion here in everything um, I may want that floor to leaf where it's kind of standing proud a little bit over that uh, leaf model that's underneath it Florida lease not Florida leaf I keep saying leaf but it's lease uh, Florida lease um, I may want that kind of standing proud just like if I had a deer in front of a little log cabin or whatever I might want the deer looking like it's standing in front of that log cabin well in order to do that I have options I have tilting the model fading the model or adjusting the models shape height and base height let's talk about the shape height and base height first and again let's go into a side view here <clears throat> excuse me and let's tilt this let's get it in the center here and tilt it down so we can see it well okay and so in my Fleur de Lis uh, in my properties if I adjust the shape height now the shape height is the model itself now some models may have some base the straight meat that's on the bottom of them you know before the curves and the contours and everything uh, and and in some models when they're imported especially third-party model files when you import it in if it has a lot of base meat on the back end of it you know where it's just kind of all straight and then our little shape happens whatever it is unfortunately when we import that model in that's all considered shape height uh, and everything and so when we adjust the shape height it kind of you know deals with that but these models right here do not have base right now they are all shaped so the contours start from the flat plane the contours start up and 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 everything and that's all shape now if I added base height to the fleur de lis so if I come in here and add let's say um, roughly about a quarter inch of base height you're gonna see it raise up and it's gonna be straight material underneath it so this everything from this contour and curve down is the base height okay and everything from this contour and up is the shape height so if I gave my shape some more height let's go uh, about half an inch then I'm puffing up that model's shape okay 
So let's take that base height back down to zero and look at this shape height of this model. Now it looks like an upside down canoe, you know, uh, on that fleur de lis. Uh, but uh, we, we've, we've adjusted that shape height and the base height, if I gave that a quarter of an inch, that's that straight meat underneath. Now I may want to, uh, in order to get one model to stand in front of another, I may want to either increase the shape height if that doesn't distort the detail too crazily, or I may just want to give it some base height so it kind of is a little bit taller than that model that's underneath it. Always the model underneath that we're kind of focusing on. Now here's the problem with that. If I start giving too much shape height, and base height, if I have a lot of models that are stacking up to kind of create this three-dimensional scene, hell, by the time it's all done, my model could be like six inches thick. And I'm trying to carve this model out of a three-quarter inch board or something. So I've got to be kind of very picky and choosy on what I'm doing. Am I going to reduce the height of one model and, and increase the height of another so that I can kind of get the scenery that I want without going too crazy where I need a, a six inch block of wood to carve this model out of? I need to keep it within some restraints because if I go too thick and I'm getting everything built up and man, that looks awesome, but now I need to reduce the overall height to carve in my three quarter inch board because I don't have inch and a half thick material or two inch or whatever. Then when I reduce that Z height of that overall model, I am now sacrificing the quality of the detail. I'm losing detail in that model. What I mean by that is let's turn off the fleur de leaf for a moment and let's look at the detail in this kind of a leaf scroll scroll leaf model here uh, and everything and i've got you know decent detail so when i tilt it to the side there's decent detail in there but if i came in and reduced or scaled the z height of that let's say i needed to bring it down uh from its 0.3 right now 0.3125 let's say i needed to bring it down an eighth of an inch and everything, when I reduce that down, I am sacrificing the detail. So my grooves and uh, some of the details in the leaves are now gone, I've lost that. So if I'm not careful when I'm building up my model scenery or you know combining my models and stuff, if I'm not careful and my model ends up being too big when it's all said and done and then all of a sudden, shoot, I gotta scale that down, I'm losing. I, I've just wasted kind of a lot of time uh, because I just lost most of the major details, especially on the models on the lower end of things, right? So aside from changing the shape height or adding base height to it, I have other options like tilting or fading. So let's go back and uh, I'm gonna hit undo on my scale Z height to get my uh, leaf back and hopefully this is not too boring for you just yet. We're gonna get into some cool stuff here in a minute. I'm just trying to give you a breakdown of the basics right now, and then we'll get, you know, we'll start making something that's worthwhile, right? Um, but uh, hopefully this isn't too boring for you up to this point. Now, let's turn the fleur de leaf back on. And on this fleur de leaf, uh, let's go back into its properties and I'm gonna reset the heights back to their default, okay? Uh, and so, you know, I have one model that's, uh, you know, lower than the other. So again, we're back to our default and stuff. Now, by the way, just so you know, I want you to look at, uh, when I select the models from the component tree over here, uh, when I select the um, Acanthus model, the it'll, it'll be red, okay? Uh, and that means it's selected. But if I zoom in very closely, uh, you're gonna see the green tint here. And what that green tint is telling me is that part of my selected model is inside or obstructed from view by the model that is combined with it. Uh, whether it's the model that's behind it or above it, part of my model is 
is obstructed by that other component. So the green is showing me the, that part. That's what that is. Okay. Um, now, when I if I were to select on the Fleur de Leaf, you'll see that I, uh, I have a majority of green here in the Acanthus model. And that's just letting me know that of my Fleur de Leaf, all of that part of that Fleur de Leaf model is being obstructed by the Acanthus model. And, uh, you know, it's hidden, if you will. Uh, it's inside of it, kind of merged with it, if you will. Uh, so let's look at if I took my Fleur de Leaf here and Fleur de Lis, I keep saying leaf, Fleur de Lis, and let's say I wanted to tilt that model. Now, when I go into the properties here, I have the options of uh, tilting and fading here. I actually do not like working with the tilt and fade in this menu here. I prefer to work with the tilt and fade in the 3D view. And what I mean by that, if I go to fade this, I can't fade it in the 3D view because I'm in this, this particular menu right here. And again, that's the little black wrench here. Uh, I have to actually do it in my 2D view. So I have to work with the tilt and fade from here in my 2D view. And my 2D view is not showing me really a whole lot. So if I come in here and I click on my fade and my set, uh, I get a, my mouse has this little ruler next to it, my cursor. I wish I could zoom in on that cursor so you can see, but I get this little ruler. And when I'm fading, the first place that I click is kind of the area that I want to keep. And the second place I click is what I want to start disappearing and fading away. I want it to start slowly, gradually fading from my first click to my second click. Okay. So if I click at the top of this fleur de lis, and then I come down and I got this little line here and I come straight down and I click on the bottom of this fleur de lis, then I can see in the 2D view that my grayscale changed a bit, but that shows me absolutely nothing uh, in the 2D view. So I prefer to actually work in the 3D view. And when I select a model in the 3D view, and put that model in transform mode. That means when I double click in it, I get my little boxes around that model. At the very bottom, there is a blue box, a blue square. If I click on that blue square, it will open up the 3D property windows for that model. And now I can work with my fade or my tilt in here, and I can actually see what the results are. So I get better, um, I get better, uh, Um, hold on, there's a word for it. I get better, I get a better uh, idea of what's happening, right? Uh, and there is a word for it, I got, I, but I have a better visual. There you go. Uh, and um, let's see here. Um, Hexa, uh, yeah, I'll definitely check out your YouTube channel and everything. Uh, Hexa CNC, thanks for popping in and stuff. Uh, I'm glad you enjoy the videos. Um, so in the menu here now, uh, I can see what I'm doing and the fading is not going to do really a lot for me in the uh, with the Florida leaf because it's behind it. So I'm going to fade the acanthus. So let's select the acanthus here uh, and I'm going to click on the box for that and get the properties for the acanthus and I'm going to fade. And now when I click on set, I, my mouse turns into this little anchor with a number one next to it. And that's kind of telling me this is going to be my setting for my first click. So again, where I click first is what I want to keep. And where I click second is where I want to fade to. Okay. So I'm going to click down here at the bottom of the acanthus. And now my mouse gets there, the, gets the anchor with the number two, meaning it's waiting for my second click. And I can click in different angles, depending on if I want to fade away this way or start disappearing this way or top or bottom or whatever. But I'm going to just click up here uh, kind of towards the top of this acanthus for my second click. And by default, the fading is set to 50%, meaning that my model about 50% or so, it's going to start fading away more and more and more, and it's going to start disappearing into that other model. So 
Let's turn the fading off for a minute. All right, so I'm here now. And if I turn that fading, uh, let's turn it up to 75% uh, here, then about uh, 75 percent I'm gonna start fading and it's gonna a majority of it's gonna be faded away and so now when I look at this I kind of have almost this combined looking model which you know in itself almost kind of looks like hey that's that might be a nice neat look for it right so I didn't add any shape height to my model I didn't add any base height, so I didn't build it up any more than I needed to. I simply faded one model into another to kind of get you know what I want. Well, now, this might not be what I want. I might want, yes, that to start fading away uh, into the model, but I might want my fleur de leaf to be a little bit more exposed, right? So I faded the acanthus to kind of, you know, start to get that to start disappearing so that way I'm reducing model height rather than adding it and everything uh, still reserving uh, the detail down in here in the leaves and all I do sacrifice some of the detail up where it's fading away of course because it we're making it disappear into the other one but now I can come into my fleur de leaf and instead of fading it making it disappear I want to tilt it and so uh, let's close the properties and click on our little blue box for our fleur de leaf. And on this one, I want to tilt it. Now, tilting a model is like sticking a wedge underneath it. That wedge, okay, the first place we click is the thin part of the wedge. The second place we click is the thick part of the wedge. So when I'm wedging a model, where, what do I want kind of raised up or not moving? You know, I just want to raise it up. So I'm going to be sticking this wedge in there. So the first place I click is that thin part. The second place I click is the thick part that's bringing that part out. Okay. So for this one, I need to stick the wedge in so that the, and let's get this on the screen here and zoom in so we can see the whole thing. In this here, I need the thin part of the wedge to be at the top of the fleur de leaf, but I need the thicker part of that wedge to be back here to kind of bring that bottom part of that fleur de lis out. So I'm going to hit set, get my anchor, and so my first place I click is the thin part of the wedge. The second place I click is going to be the thick part of the wedge. Once I click my second uh, click there, I can now come over and set the degrees of that angle, that tilt. So I'll bring this up to about 2.8 degrees uh, and uh, start bringing that out. Now, if we look at it from the side here, if we look, oops, not that far to the side. Hold on a second, guys. Uh, oops, uh, don't drag your models around. Let's hit Control Z to undo. <clears throat> Put it back. There we go. All right. So let's drag this down and all. So here on my tilt, I did not need to go 2.8 degrees of tilt to get it to stand proud of that acanthus. So I'm going to now reduce my tilt down. Let's go to about one degree. And all I want is my model to be, you know, up above. So I want to go a little bit more than one degree. So let's uh, bring that up to let's go 1.4 degrees all right so I got a little bit more to go down here I want that just a little bit proud a little bit more not much so I'm gonna bring it to 1.6 degrees and I can tell by the green in there where I'm at and that is gonna be fine for me because when I look at it in a front view my fleur de lis is in front of that acanthus now okay and i didn't have to tilt it very much to get that part to stick out the way i need it so i have that look so overall if i look at this from the side let's bring it over onto the screen and let's tilt it a little bit zoom in zoom in zoom in All right, 
so we can let's bring it out just a little bit so we can see that wedge form starting in our fleur de lis we can see that base height that base height increase on that back side you know tilting it up and everything uh kind of that wedge shape if you will but i didn't need to bring up too much tilt to get that fleur de lis on top of that acanthus right and so I didn't really, I, I didn't, I didn't add any base height except for that tilt area where it wedged up. Uh, it wasn't too extreme, so my model's still within my parameters to cut out of my three-quarter inch board and all. Uh, I got the result that I wanted and things like that. So we have adding shape height, base height, tilting, or fading. Those are some of the things, the tools or features that we can use when we're combining our models to get when we're creating our sceneries and stuff to get the results that we want hopefully this uh hopefully that explains something <laughs> to you guys and girls uh and and maybe helps out a little bit uh but let's now talk about the other two options uh we, we we're right now our two models are merged together that means both of them retain their rigidity and they are blended and merged together one shape is not conforming to another or anything they're just merging together and they are um you know we would tilt fade change base height shape height whatever we wanted to do you know with that but they're merged together and they keep their same rigidity uh add the top model conforms to the model that's underneath it. Now let's talk about, on that fleur de lis, let's talk about subtract, right? Well, we already talked about subtract, so subtract, it takes away. Uh, but let's talk about merge low. So merge low uh, means that we are merging the two models uh, together at their lowest points. And so notice what just happened to my fleur de lis. My, uh, I had everything from that acanthus back, every part of that fleur de lis uh, that, that from the contact, let me put, I'm using my hands, but let me use my mouse here. Everything on that fleur de lis from here back on my acanthus has merged it's been the the height of that part of that model has now been reduced to merge in with that acanthus okay so uh it basically just takes all of that and it takes that outline let's go into a top view here it takes everything uh, uh that outlines that acanthus you know that acanthus border if you will and it reduces anything that's within that acanthus, it reduces that shape height down and merges it at its lowest point with that model. Now, this may not be a desired option because look what it does here uh, with our fleur de leaf. It's almost like it just, you know, everything on the outside of that acanthus just got cut away and, and shrunken down. Uh, and, you know, uh, we may not, that might not be our, our, our intention. Um, you know, uh, there, there are specific times where this would be a useful feature. I will tell you that in my six years of modeling, uh, the merge low and the next one multiply that we talk about, I've never used. I've never come across a need to use them, but... There, I'm sure there is a need because it's there, right? We have that feature. So there are reasons for it, and there may be some videos out there that show really great examples of what those reasons are, but I've not been able to come up with a good reason to use that, uh, that merge low uh, in six years, and so I'm not going to try to come up with a reason right now. Uh, it's, it's one of those options that I don't use because it, it doesn't give me that desired effect that I'm looking for. If I want if I want to get rid of a section of that model or something, I have options like clipping or if I had a spire, I have options like uh, you know, deleting part of a model and stuff, but if I have desktop and pro, I have clipping 
meaning I can draw a vector around the area I want to keep and anything outside of that vector gets deleted. I'll show you clipping in a minute. We're going to talk about clipping coming up um, and stuff. And so merge low, just know that what it does is it takes anything that's within that model that's underneath it and it subtracts it away and reduces it down and merges it with that model. And not a desired effect. Let's go back to our merge so we get our bat model back before we go to multiply. Now, multiply uh, is this last little circle here. And when we multiply, and I'm, I've still got my fleur de leaf selected, but when we multiply a model, let's click on multiply here. Sorry, I got the hiccups. Uh, but what the uh, multiply does is really weird. And again, I've never really had a need for it. But basically, it took uh, on our fleur de leaf anything that was outside of the acanthus basically uh, virtually got removed. Uh, it's still there in, in shadow form and everything. You can see the shadow and outline, um, but uh, it has, it has uh, pretty much gotten rid of it. And that's mostly because I'm still tilted, right? I'm still tilted. Let me turn the tilting off so we can see it as a flat plane because you can see that tilt down here is hidden. Let's turn the tilting off for a minute and still stay in multiply mode. And what you're going to see is turning that tilt off really didn't do anything as far as that's concerned. But what it did is it did kind of twofold. It multiplied these models together, meaning that everything outside of the acanthus it kind of faded away, got rid of it. Everything inside the acanthus of that fleur de leaf, it actually removed that portion of the acanthus model, kind of just got rid of it, and then it kind of reduced everything down and flattened it out, almost like a merge low, if you will, but it actually kind of deleted everything that was shaped like the fleur de leaf of the acanthus. It got rid of all that. And then it took that fleur de leaf and it reduced it down to a merge low kind of aspect. And then everything that was outside of the border of that acanthus, it got rid of. And again, it's one of those combined modes that I, have not found a really good reason to use this. And some of you may have. Some of you may uh, be modeling pros and you're rocking it out and you're like, oh dude, I use multiply all the time. It's great for this or great for that, whatever the case may be. Uh, but I'm not that guy because I, I don't use that because looking at this, I would have absolutely no reason if I was combining these two models for this outcome. And very rarely, uh, do I have a reason for any kind of outcome? I don't care what models are to do this type of subtraction, get rid of, delete, and, and things like that uh, and stuff. So, but that's what multiply does. Everything outside the model underneath, it kind of re removes, but everything that's within that model that's underneath, it removes that model, that portion shaped like that fleur de leaf, and then, but it reduces that fleur de leaf down to, you know, our low height uh, and stuff. So that is kind of how our combined modes uh, go. And typically, you're going to merge high or merge low, uh, uh, or merge high. Typically, 90% of the time, you're merging high. Uh, or you're adding a model. If you need it to kind of drape over and create the shape, you're going to see me add in, in a little bit. Or you might be subtracting where it's a dome or a dish. So if I have a model and I have a, a circle that I'm creating a shape and I dish it, I'm subtracting that dish. Okay, uh, and everything. All right, and so uh, let's go ahead and delete these two models here. Okay, and now let's, all right, so everything I just showed you, again, Desktop, Pro, Aspire, that applies to all three, okay? Now I'm gonna show you clipping so we can remove parts of a model that we don't want and again, Desktop Pro and Aspire, all of them have the features of clipping. Now, clipping was introduced to us 
in version 10. It was either 9.5 or 10. Uh, so if you have uh, those versions are higher than you have clipping in your levels. So if we right click on a level, we can see clipping here. But versions, earlier versions of the Vetric software, uh, Desktop Pro and Aspire, let's say, I'm gonna say 9.5 back, it might be 10 and back. But clipping wasn't an option. We didn't have that option, which is a very cool option to have. All right. And so, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and everything. Now, um, Michael Mezalik says uh, that multiply is best used when placing a 3D component in a dish. Okay, in a dish. Now, Michael, I'm going to uh, before we get into clipping, Michael, I'm gonna I'm gonna try that uh, to see what you're referring to. I'm gonna contest it a little bit, but I'm contesting without the knowledge of if that is a is true as true statement. Because let's just try it. And let's see here, because you might have a valid point. I don't know, right? I'm not saying that you're wrong uh, by any means. Don't think that, Michael. Uh, but uh, best used when placing a 3D model in a dish, that kind of throws me off a little bit. And I'm going to create a dish. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to create, let's go into the 3D view. Uh, and uh, it would help if I, yeah, my vector is selected. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to create a dish a dome dish and I'm gonna go I'm just gonna go uh, let's go 60 degrees for right now 60 degrees and subtract that dish and I'm gonna click apply I don't know why I paused there for like 20 seconds uh, but I'm gonna click apply okay and I'm gonna click close Now this is a big circle, right? 24 inch circle, so the dish looks deep and all that stuff, but it's not really. Uh, and now I'm gonna add a zero plane in here so we can see, kind of get a resemble of our, our material uh, with our dish. Okay, so I've got this dish here and it's a, 60, it's a big circle on a 60 degree dish, so it's quite deep. So I'm actually gonna reduce the height a little bit. Let's go into the properties of that component. <clears throat> let's go into the properties of that and let's uh, take our four inch height here and let's reduce that to a little bit more reasonable. I'm going to go three quarters. So let's reduce that down. So I've got this dish now. Okay. All right. So let that regenerate. We're good. We're good. Everybody good. Oh, still waiting for it to, there we go. Okay. So I've got this dish, this 60 degree dish here. And now I'm going to bring in another model, another clip art. And let's go uh, for, for right now so I can kind of look at where I'm at, where I place this and everything. Uh, let's uh, go with, uh, we did the Fleur de Leaf, but let's grab another project. Um, let's grab this cool flourish right here. And let's kind of drag and drop that somewhat centered. Now, this model as it comes in is going to come in as an add mode. Uh, let's size this up. To right about here. Okay. Let's size this up. And let's come back into our modeling. And in the add mode, let me reduce, bear with me, let me reduce my, um, my dish a little bit more so we can see things a little bit better. Uh, 0 0.75, enter. There we go. Uh, let's go a little deeper. Let's go, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around guys. 1.25, 1.25. 
I just want to be able to see that contour a little bit. Not too much, but a little. There we go. All right, so uh, coming in here. Now, because, again, remember that add mode acts like a sheet. It takes over the shape of the shape that's underneath it. And because of this flourish that I just dropped in as an add, the combined mode for the flourish is an add mode. It is taking on the shape of the dish that's underneath it. So if I was creating a model in a dish, me personally, I would add. Now, let's do multiply and let's see how that affects it because it could be the most amazing thing that I never knew about, right? And all that stuff, so let's do it. So, um, Michael, if you have any feedback on this, tell me if, uh, if you would multiply the top model or the lower model. I'm gonna multiply the top model to see what the result is. And then I'll multiply the bottom one and we'll see what the result is. So let's go into the flourish properties here. And let's change it to multiply. Give it a second to regenerate. Okay, so what that has done, if we come in here, is basically, again, everything uh, that was around our dish and all, uh, the, that flourish and everything got subtracted down, and then everything in the dish got removed and deleted. So we have this outer part of this dish and everything, but everything inside of this area, or kind of outside this area, if you will, has gotten removed. So I get you know thinner as I go in the middle to this thicker outer edge. So again, this multiplying this top model, definitely not the result that I want. So let's turn multiply off on the top model. Then we'll do the bottom one see how that looks, and then we'll multiply both and see how that looks. So we'll go back to an add mode on here. Get that back, okay? And uh, let's, let's, on our component uh, down here, our dish, we're gonna turn that one into a multiply. So let's select that dish. And let's change this to multiply. And, okay. Now, what has happened is my everything outside of my dish has been removed. And now my floor delete has a bit of a reverse dome to it, okay? Just there, not, not floor delay, sorry, the flourish has this kind of dome to it because it, when our, when our flourish was, uh, you know, an ad and we multiplied it, remember it subtracted, it kind of sucked down and then everything within that got removed. Well, now because our dish was sucked down, it's raised up now and everything outside of that's been removed. So that dish is no longer there, but now my Flourish has kind of this almost like little a slight dome to it, you know. So again, I don't end up with the model in the dish. Now, that being said, let's change our flourish to a multiply as well and see how the two interact. All right, so let's, we've got this as a multiply. Let's go into our flourish. Come on, flourish. Select flourish, come on. Might have to change my 50% uh, settings down a little bit to get a little bit better reaction out of this. Come on, there we go. All right, so on my flourish,
Come on, Flourish. <laughs> Hold on a minute, guys. Flourish. Come on, brother. Bear with me a second. All right, let's go in here. Let's reduce this down just for a moment. It's one of the things that we got to deal with when we're in a high resolution. I'm going to bring it down just to the very high just for this. And um, it uses a lot of resources. All right, let's go back in there and let's select that flourish. All right, now in our flourish, we want to also change that to a multiply. So now our flourish is being multiplied and our dish is being multiplied and we end up with nothing, right? The best of both worlds, nothing. Okay, we just end up with our zero plane. So when adding one model to a dish, it is best that they be add modes so that the model that's in the dish conforms to the dish okay and I need my dish to be a subtract not an add because it's a dome when it's an add Laney there we go so we add the model conforming to that dish now Michael I'm sorry I don't know uh, if there is an example that would give me this result with the multiply. That's why I said I want to contest it a little bit because I don't, I'm not, you know, again, I never use multiply six years, right? I've never found a good reason. But looking at this example and those three things that I did, none of them gave me the result that I want, which is the model in the dish, right? So uh, let's see here. Laney, uh, layer one is 3D component ornament. Layer two is the dish. Uh, layer is set to multiply with a shape height of one. Layer three is a copy of the dish set to add. 430 mark of the video. It's very useful but complex to wrap your head around. What video? 1430 mark of the video. So Michael, tell me what video that is and I'll go watch it and everything and then we'll follow up on that for sure. Because uh, I definitely want to see um, I definitely want to see that uh, because hey, I'm, I don't know everything, right? I want to get educated too, right? So I'll definitely tell, let me know what video that is and um, we'll go there. Because uh, the multiply uh, in the three scenarios that I did, uh, none of them gave me the result of my model in the dish like I want, right? Okay. Uh, but I'm going to research what you tell me to research. We'll come back and we'll follow up on that one for sure. All right. So combined modes, you guys get it, got it, and all that stuff. And we were about to talk about clipping uh, before this discussion, which was a great discussion because I want to see where that goes uh, and stuff and I'll learn I'll learn from that. So thank you Michael for bringing that topic up and it'll give me something to go explore. Uh, I'm always up about upping my skills and knowledge as well. Um, for sure. All right, let's get rid of our uh, let's clip the flourish. Let's get rid of our dish, delete that and let's get rid of our zero plane for now. Delete that. Absolutely. And anytime you guys uh, and girls have tips or things that uh, that I don't know or anything, tell me so I can go. I'm I'm all about watching, learning, and I love learning from other others, other YouTubers, other people better than me because I'm not I'm not the I'm not the I'm not the be it all be it whatever you want to call uh, you know I have flaws and I don't know a whole lot and I darn sure don't know about multiplying because <laughs> I don't. It doesn't give me the effect that I want. 
All right, so let's go in and talk about clipping for a moment. All right, so on this model here, we're gonna work with just this model uh, for the moment. And uh, I want to keep, I'm gonna center this model onto my material. So I want it split right down the center here. And I wanna keep just half of this model because I wanna do something with the other half, whatever it may be. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, in my case, I'm gonna draw a rectangle. Now you can draw, it could be a, a, a wheelie line, it could be whatever you want it to be. But in my case, for this one, I'm gonna just draw a rectangle around it. So I'm gonna take a rectangle and I'm gonna draw a rectangle right at my center line. And I wanna draw it around the area that I wanna keep, which is this area in here. Uh, and I wanna get rid of everything outside of that rectangle. Uh, let's go ahead and reduce this rectangle down a little bit. I don't need to be too extravagant. All right, so now in my level, if I right click on my level, I have options like mirror mode, clipping, uh, and things like that. We'll talk about mirror mode in a second. But with clipping, uh, if I have my vector selected, and on my level here, if I apply clipping to that level, any component that is on that level that is with that is outside of that rectangle that I have selected, it will be removed or it will not show. Now in the 2D view, nothing happens, right? We, we can see our model. But in our 3D view, you can see that we have clipped away half of that model, right? So let's go with a side by side here. So we still have our model. We can see the component that's been removed that's outside of our vector and everything in the 2D view, but the 3D view is where it all comes together. Now I'm gonna go into clip art and I'm going to add uh, a, uh, another component, if you will, to this. So let's come in and uh, let's grab this. and size it up. Okay. Now you can see here that I imported this into level one, so it's only showing me what is inside of that rectangle, right? And that's not what I want. I want this whole model, this whole second model. So I'm gonna, this is where levels comes in. This is one aspect of levels. I wanna create a new level and that second flourish, I need it to be in that level where there is no clipping affected at all. And now I have two levels. And how models combine with one another in a level and how levels combine with each other are two different things. You're gonna see that in just a moment. So right now, this model is set to add right? And it's taken on the shape of the model that's underneath. Remember, uh, if we turn it to the side, it's taking on that shape of the model that's underneath. I don't want that. But if I change my combine mode to merge on this model, doesn't affect anything. That's because that model is on another level and that level's combine mode is set to add, meaning that that level is adding to level one the level that's underneath it. And so I'm getting the same effect. In order for me to get that merge effect, I need to merge my level. Okay? Even if my flourish was set to add, again, doesn't affect it because my level is merging with the level that's underneath it. So it is merging this component with what's underneath it. Now, why is that? Uh, why why is that beneficial to us and everything? Because we may have two models that need to add together. They need to stack on top of each other. But we need those models once they're stacked. We need them to merge with another model. So we're going to put those models that need to stack together. We're going to add them every, you know, on one level, we're going to have those, let's say I've got two models that need to stack together 
and everything. I'm going to have them on one level, so they're adding together. They're they're conforming to the shape that's underneath. And then I, I need to merge that whole component to whatever is on the level below it. You'll see that in just a moment when we do something that, that involves that. Uh, in this case, I only have one component here, all right? And, uh, and everything. Um, where this uh, comes into uh, play is, you know, let's say now that I am, I'm starting to kind of build a new component here, right? And so, all right, I'm building this new component, but it looks kind of funky uh, how it's, uh, you know, blending and stuff in here. And uh, let me uh, change the, I want to bring this up a little bit right about there, keep it centered. Okay. Uh, and I want to get rid of everything, every part of this model that is inside this component that's underneath it. Okay. Um, and, you know, let's say that, let me find a good, where it looks decent. Okay. Uh, decent enough. This model is really rough around the edges, but when everything smooths out, it's fine. All right, so uh, let's go up a little bit higher, a little bit higher. Hold on a second. All right. That's good. Okay, so I need to get rid of everything that's inside of this box and everything in here. Uh, or inside of my other model and stuff and I need to uh, you know I want it all to disappear so here's what I'm gonna do I'm actually gonna take my component my flourish down here and I'm gonna use the create boundary tool right I'm gonna create boundary tools so that way it creates this vector and only it only creates the vector for that half of a part right uh, because that's all that's visible when clipping is turned on so I'm gonna get rid of the rectangle just for a minute so you can see this vector here, right, of this part that I drew. Now I can use that vector as a clipping vector. So I can, in my level two, I can have that vector selected and I can clip away. But wait a minute, Laney, that's ass backwards. You just said, that you want a vector around the part that you want to keep and everything outside of that vector you're going to remove. You're absolutely right. So what I actually need to do is I need to basically combine this model, this basically clipped vector here, and I need to come in here and create a boundary around my other component, which is here now. And I need to do some trimming. So I'm gonna come in and use my scissors. And I want to trim and combine all of these together. So I want, uh, let's, first of all, we gotta turn off or ungroup. Let's ungroup our vectors here, ungroup. And this one too is already ungrouped, great. Now I can trim. So let's zoom in. I want to trim this away. Um, this, 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 all of this, all this stuff inside. I'll come back and delete that. Let's come over here. I want to keep this all the way to here, to there. And then all this inside stuff here I can delete. And then over in here is very important as well. Um, on my model, let's see, I want to come in and remove all of that. Excellent. All right, so get rid of all this excess stuff down here. So now I have this shape here, right here, all the way around, and then kind of where that half of that part takes off. Now I can turn clipping on. Uh, go back in our layer here and clipping apply it'll get rid of everything in there okay and so I have this but now they don't really combine very well because you know this model that's outside is a little higher than the other 
uh, this is where I would have to reduce some shape height now. So let's come into our flourish. Uh, we may do some fading or what have you, but first I'm going to start off with reducing the shape height just a little bit. So I'm going to bring the shape height down to 0.375. Oops, too many decimal points. Okay, and then I'm going to do a bit of fading. Fading, because if we look, you can still see, you know, that area kind of riding high here and stuff. And uh, here, so I'll need to do some fading. I may have to do some fading on both aspects because I have this high part here, right? And all that stuff. So I might have to just kind of fade one and the other. So they blend together much better or find two models that actually fit together a lot better. Um, either way, uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's do a little bit of fading. And this will be the last example on this and then we're going to move on and we're going to actually look at some of the projects I've created and, uh, you know, uh, talk about how they got combined and everything. Uh, so first one is this one here. Uh, I'm going to turn fading on <clears throat> and I'm going to set. And again, down here, I'm going to click first. Up here, I'm going to click second. Okay, to get that to fade away a bit. And on this one here, let's close this. On this model here this one is going to be tilted not faded uh, so it's going to be a tilt and I want the thin part of the wedge up here at the top thick part of the wedge down here and let's get some tilt going on there okay a little bit of tilt and then I'm also going to fade this. So it's going to have tilt and fade to it. So set, I want to keep this up here, fade away here. All right. So uh, let's turn down my fading a little bit or my tilting a little bit. It was a little extreme there. A little bit more. Okay, let's turn the fading up a bit. A little bit more. Uh, actually, we'll leave that one be. Uh, and uh, let's get back into this one. Turn that fading up a bit. Okay. Now, at this point here, uh, if you had a spire, this is where you would start to blend these models together. Uh, and uh, sculpt them together and everything because they're really not two models that actually fit together very well at these areas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and open up. I'm going to select these two components and I'm going to open up my tool and it says, hey, in order for this to be able to be sculpted, they got to be on the same level, right? They got to be baked and on the same level. Okay, so I have to, um, you know, get these two on the same level. But if I put them on the same level, then I'm going to lose trimming that I did. I'm going to use, I'm going to lose uh, the, um, that separation, that merge that I'm doing and all. And so I've really got a, a, I'm a fight for this one. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, we're going to bake this. Okay. Uh, we're going to take this one and bake it. Now I should, now that I've baked that model, I should, because look at my 2D view. Everything got removed in the 2D view once I baked it together, or baked it. So all of my other models and excess are gone now. So now I should be able to drop this down into that level, turn the clipping off, remove the clipping, okay? And I want them to merge together. Then we'll set them to merge. 
So they blend. And now I can go in and sculpt. And sculpting is an Aspire thing, guys and girls that have desktop and pro. Uh, it is um, it is an Inspire thing. Uh, so before I sculpt, I need to take these two models here and bake them together. There we go. Now I can sculpt it. <clears throat> okay. And on my sculpting, I'm going to do a little smudging. Uh, let's twiddle our view. I love that term, twiddle our view. That means I can tilt it and all that wonderful stuff. And I'm going to do a little bit of smudging first. And smudging means that I'm kind of pulling uh, my component, kind of smearing it, if you will, uh, into it and everything. So I'm kind of smudging uh, these parts together a bit, kind of bringing them down so they blend. Uh, a little better. Uh, we'll smooth that out. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let's do the same thing here. I'm kind of blending this in uh, to that models underneath it. How much power or strength your blending uses and all that stuff to, is over here. You can set that. Um, but uh, I want to kind of blend these components together a bit. If I have to remove some material or redefine my shape, I'll do that as well. So I want it to kind of blend and conform and stuff. And now I'll come back and smooth uh, those areas out a bit to make it one. Let's come back. Oops, Lord of mercy, where'd you go, Lane? Let's twiddle my view back to where it was. There we go. So I'll come back in uh, and smooth. I didn't do any sculpting of there, so I'll just do it over here. Start smoothing that together so it blends and plays nice with one another. You know, take on that shape and stuff. All right, so uh, now I, you know, I've kind of combined those two uh, that was kind of quick and hasty. I'd probably spend a little bit of extra time, you know, uh, get a nice clean combine, combine. But you know, I can. I I was able to clip away part of one model, clip away part of another, merge them together, and blend. Okay, uh, and then do some sculpting. Now I could have done the clipping and clipping and all in Desktop and Pro. Uh, and you know, tried to get them to blend together and merge the best I could, but I don't have the sculpting tool that Aspire has, so I'm kind of stuck, right? Uh, what can I do? There's really not a whole lot I can do there. I have to just kind of basically kind of maybe organize those models and get them positioned or you know things, maybe do a little bit of clipping in some other areas and all so they really come together nicely and everything. Uh, because I don't have sculpting. I don't have the ability to smooth things out and stuff uh, that way. Uh, I do have a smoothing function, but I don't have the ability to sculpt like I'm sculpting clay, right? So that's our that's our one limitation uh, in Desktop and Pro uh, and all. If I didn't have Desktop and Pro, I would have to look at a way to kind of get these two models to blend together. All right, so... Uh, I want to get out of get back out of that, and let's get out of this project altogether, and let's open up a project that uh, uh, I'm working with here. <clears throat> now, I told you that I have some Fourth uh, of July models uh, available and and things like that. Uh, that uh, I've, um, you know, a package, a 4th of July package. I'll show you uh, some of the uh, models that are going to be available in that pack if you're interested uh, for download. Um, while that project is loading, I might as well show you some images.
the one project that we're working on right now. This is one of the photos. This black screen is one of the photos. Uh, this is one of the photos here. Kind of this uh, 1776 uh, flag with the uh, um, Declaration of Independence <laughs> in it. Uh, there we go. Uh, so it's kind of has this torn feature with this flat function and all. We're going to see that model in just a second. I'm going to show you how adding and different levels and everything, you know, come to be with this. Um, there's another view, a front view there. Uh, simple little uh, V carve signs. So there's uh, one there. Um, We've got this uh, established July 4th, 1776, you know, July 4th, uh, shield flag and eagle. Uh, fireworks, July 4th, right? Little sign. Uh, a vertical God bless America sign. Uh, the United States flag uh, shaped like the United States uh, that you can be V carved in. In this case, it's got God bless America land that I love V carved in it. Uh, but that model file uh, you'll get as well as that model file with the eagle. Okay, so uh, things to consider. All right, so that's some of our 4th July projects. Uh, we do have a uh, 2A project. If you don't like guns, look away. Uh, our 2A project here. Uh, is a separate, it's separate from the 4th of July. This is our AR project. Uh, I'm 77, 1776% sure that no one will be coming to take my gun. No one would take my guns. Uh, with a, uh, the second amendment uh, could be V card down in grade there. So that's one. And this comes with a variety of models. Uh, it comes with a blank flag. It comes with the flag with the AR. It comes with uh, just the stars in the 1776. And so that project pack is available as well. So we have a 4th of July project pack and a 2A project pack. Uh, they're both $25 each uh, with all of those and instructions and all that wonderful jazz. But uh, again, just like you did with the Father's Day for you guys and girls, if you're interested in that, just email laney.shaughnessy at spindletv.com uh, with either 4th of July package in the subject line or 2A package in the subject line, either one. All right, so this particular flag here, if we look at all of the different components, look at my levels here. I have five different levels on how this model combines with one another. Uh, let's turn off each of the individual components here. Okay. And so on this model, building this model up, uh, we have a, um, hold on, let's turn off this one as well. And go away. There we go. And that one. Okay. So we start off with a blank slate. We are always building from the foundation up, right? Okay. Uh, and so from here, I needed uh Three on level two here, I needed three separate components to merge with, uh, I'm sorry, two separate components to kind of merge with one another. And then I needed that level to be added to the level that's underneath. And my level that's underneath is just my flat plane. I need it to sit on top, right? I don't want it to merge inside of it. I want it to sit on top of it but I needed my models to merge with each other. So the first model, let's turn off our, uh, our flat level here, our base, if you will, uh, our foundation, and let's turn on our two components here. So our first component, our first model is the uh, stripes. Our second component is gonna be the square in the top corner. Okay, and those two parts needed to merge together, all right? Once they were merged together, 
Uh, these stripes and all had a draft added to them. Again, that's another Aspire feature that creates an angle. Just instead of a straight, you know, square, it's kind of got a little bit of a draft to the sides, a little angle. And so when they were merged uh, together, they could then, because they're on level two that is being added to level one, they could then sit on the base and this gives my flag some substance, some, some thickness to it. So that half inch base. So now I have this flag and base, you know, uh, where those stripes are sitting on top of that base and everything. But these two components were merged together and then they're sitting on top of that base, right? That gives me the thickness of that flag. So that's how you use the levels to create that. Now, in our next levels, level three okay now level three i didn't need all three components they're adding okay they're adding uh and so i need them to play nice with these two merged models uh because those models are set to merge i don't want my level three to kind of fall into that even though it's being added those are still set to merge right I don't want it to, I want it to play nice. I need it to kind of sit on top here and everything. So level three was created so that my components of my text and that's actually the stars, not the text. This one is the text. Okay, so that's 1776. Those two items are sitting on top of the merge component below it. So you're stacking, if you will. We're stacking, if you will. And so we have our base. On top of our base, we have our merge stripes and the union area. Those are merged together and they're sitting on top of that base. And now on top of that merge component, we have added the stars and stripes. And because level two is set to add and level three is set to add, our stars and our 1776 are sitting on top now. Okay. So now we've just created that, uh, that flag. And then uh, coming there with that, now we have a... Uh, Another, in my case, I made another draft, meaning that I added some edges, some angle to my stars in 1776. So that's that model with draft there. We won't talk about draft because uh, it just, here I will show, I'll show you what the draft does. So if we look at the 1776 here, if I turn on the drafted version that has a 30 degree draft, then <clears throat> let me turn off the other two components. So let's turn those off. <clears throat> and what the draft has done for me, let's turn off the, bear with me. On my stars in 7076, uh, on the edges, the outside edges, they are tilted out, they're drafted out 30 degrees. So instead of coming straight down, they have an angle to them. So they've got that 30 degree angle. That's what a draft is, right? So it just gives it a little bit more base meat and kind of brings it out so that my ball nose bit can follow that very well and everything. And it doesn't have to go up, over, up, over, you know, it can just kind of glide over and everything when it's carving. Um, so there's a draft there. But now if we zoom out, we have another section of this flag where part of this area here uh, kind of gets taken out. So if we come in and uh, turn on our level four components, our level four component is our crack. We have this crack here uh, that kind of uh, is split and everything. Uh, and then let's turn on uh, our second component. <clears throat> Okay, and what our second component was, <clears throat> excuse me, what our second component was, uh, and if we turn off the other two so you can see what they are by themselves. Mm 
I gotta wait to click, wait to click. Bear with me while it catches up with itself. There we go. <clears throat> all right, so level four, all level four is is a flat plane and this crack, right? And so in my levels here, if I go into my merged, let's come in here and turn off the uh, these two components, my flag was subtracted from the crack from a vector. Uh, and let's turn on just the, uh, the, the drafted copy version of this. Which you'll see in just a second. Okay. Uh, so if I were to turn off this side over here, you'll see that my flag has been split down this crack. Uh, so you can see where it follows that crack, right? So that's that flag now. Uh, let's put the base on underneath it. So our, our base, our foundation, give it our meat back underneath that union area and stuff, okay? So now we have the part of the flag was removed and then this crack was added here with a little bit more of a flat plane here as well. So this crack was added. So it has that consistent kind of closure, if you will. And then a little bit more plane, that flat plane was added here. And so that created this kind of half of a flag. Uh, add the stars into that, the union. And now we have this kind of uh, this flag that we could do some V carving on one side. Uh, I could put a you know another emblem. Let's say I wanted to do a military insignia of something and all that stuff, or whatever the case may be, uh, whatever it could be. Uh, now this happens to be a 70, 1776 union versus a standard union and stuff. But um, the one thing I will say is in the Fourth uh, of July project file, you will get two vector files of a standard U.S. flag as well as the 1776 flag vectors for V carving, whatever you want to do with it, but they are proportionally accurate. Okay. They can be scaled up or down, like that, but they're as far as proportions, regulation flag proportions and all that stuff, they're bang on. Uh, and that comes in that 4th of July pack too, those vectors, uh, lots of vectors. But we have this model to create this kind of model here we have a, a set of merged models. We have a set of added models, our stars and our 1776. We have a base plane that our, everything needs to sit on. And that's where levels comes in. You know, when we're stacking things, but we need those things in those individual stacks to blend together, multiply, subtract, whatever it is. But when they're done doing what they need to do, they need to combine with the model that's in the level underneath a certain way. Hopefully that's not confusing and you guys and girls understand that and I'm not putting you to sleep yet. Let me know if you're awake. All right, because there hasn't been a whole lot of chatter tonight. I think I'm boring everyone. Let me know if I'm boring you to death. Um, so we have this model here that now we can come in and I've got a flat plane where I can take some text, in this case, uh, the Declaration of Independence, a uh, portion of it, not the whole one, of course. Uh, and uh, I can now uh, come in and uh, create some V carving and things like that, right? So when we are stacking models, we might have to put them on different levels so they combine well with one another and each other, right, each level. Uh, in my case, I'm building models, so I need certain things to act certain ways and combine certain ways so that when the finished piece gets exported out as an STL file to send to you lovely folks that support me by purchasing those packages and things like that, um, then, uh, you know, you get these, uh, these, these cool models, right? Uh, and, and different things, right? So... You have a blank kind of cracked model like this that you can put whatever text you want on. You got a 1776 with some stars. You got a regular flag. All kinds of cool stuff. All kinds of cool models um, uh, that come in those packages and things. And uh, 
And again, this process here that I did uh, in the Aspire software, I can use a tool called the clear area uh, of component, meaning erase the area of component that's inside of a vector or outside of a vector. Well, in desktop and pro, I can do that same thing using clipping. So I could have drawn my design, you know, my vector with that little crack around the model that I want to keep and then said, okay, everything outside of this clip away, right? And so that leaves me with nothing over here that I can now, you know, um, I now have a flat plane to kind of work with and stuff, right? So, uh, and everything. Now, you don't really have uh, the ability uh, in Desktop or Pro to build up a base and all that stuff, um, but you do have the ability to kind of how things merge and all, or, or you know, our shape heights and stuff. So we could still kind of almost create this similar kind of layout uh, our step down, step down uh, from, you know, one model to our flat plane uh, is going to vary based on how thick I made this model. And it was 3 16 and stuff. Uh, if I didn't have this component, I would still have the thickness of my material because think of a three quarter inch board and my flags getting carved out of uh, 3 16 of that, right? So the flag stars and stripes. And now over here, I can select this vector and just do a pocket cut, right? I can do a pocket cut to bring that level down on this side. And uh, now I have those two levels and on. Then in that pocket, I can do my V carving all. So we can do this. We could do a project like this. Uh, if we had the components, if we had our stripes, if we had our, um, our, our stars and everything, uh, you know, maybe, well, forget it. If I had the stars, at least the stars, right? I could create this whole component in Desktop or Pro. I wouldn't need Aspire because I could draw my rectangles where I want to clip away my model, right? Those would be my clipping vectors, those rectangles, right? So I want to clip away all the lower parts of those stripes. So I could draw those rectangles in there and that could be my clipping vector and I could create those recesses on those stripes. And then... I could pocket away the vectors over here or within that vector there and create that lower level. And now I've just created this flag and then I could add import my STL of my 1776 and I could, you know, add those stars to that and done. I've created this kind of flag, right? So I might be able to go on Etsy or, or uh, Turbo Squid or Thingiverse and find a military insignia or find a union or find whatever and I could literally create something like this using clipping and pocketing and stuff like that, combining my 2D tool pass and my 3D tool pass. I could create something like this without having a spire, something this simple. There's not a whole lot of detail and stuff to it. Uh, a spire is, gives us the ability to do things with great detail and, and stuff like that. But still, you know, don't think that's just because, and you, and you probably don't, right? But um, if you're in the mindset, oh, I only have desktop, so I can't do this, or I only have pro, I can't do this. With a little bit of creative thinking and with the features of clipping and stuff, we can draw out the vectors and say, okay, of this square board, right? Uh, this model, I can, uh, in my clip art, under, under, um, domes and dishes, I've got a model here that's called a flat rectangle. I could import that in, draw my vectors and clip away the parts that I don't want. Let's lay my stripes. So now all I have is just kind of this raised area here. Uh, let's go into the 3D view. I've got just this raised area here and all this other stuff has been clipped away from that model, right? So I've got that. And then I can take and draw my vector on the right side of it and create my pocket cut. So now I've pocketed down my three quarter inch board there to create that little step. I've imported my model of my union and all and set it over there and boom, I've got the flag, right? You know, the 1776 flag. So we could do it very easily uh, using the things that we have in the software that comes with us if we don't have a spire, right? So think about that. Think about creative ways to do things like that. 
Now you can't build, you know, all kinds of components and all that stuff, but hell, I could V carve the stars in if I didn't buy the model of the stars, I could do this. But again, I provided all these components for you um, and all that cool stuff in the 4th of July uh, package. All right, and 4th of July is coming around the corner, so get it now. Uh, again, uh, for those of you that are no, um, I'll put my email address down in the chat area. Laney.Shaughnessy at SpindleTV.com. Make sure the spelling's correct. And if you wanted to, you could email me with 4th of July package in the subject line or 2A package in the... Um, in the subject line, one of the two or both, uh, and uh, I'll send you an invoice form. They're $25 for each package, and you get a whole bunch of stuff. You get about four or five models, and uh, four models in uh, the 4th of July package, along with four signs. Uh, so eight projects all together. And then in the 2A package, you get uh, five different models, and then the vectors and all to create that 2A sign that I showed you. Okay, cool stuff. Yeah. So Father's Day is up and around the corner. You guys got that. Thanks for that support again. Uh, it was great. Uh, the uh, So now we have the 4th of July and 2A packages. If you want to, awesome. That would be great support. Like I said, we were able to raise about $1,000. So that's going to go in the savings towards the building purchase and all. And every bit helps offset some of that cost of this so we can take Spindle TV to the next level, uh, get our build, bigger building so we can do our full project builds and all that wonderful stuff and we greatly appreciate it. I greatly appreciate it because I'm a one-man show. Uh, so uh, uh, besides Jake, my marketing guy who helps me with marketing and stuff. All right. So um, all right. Let's go and see if we have any. You guys were, I, I bored you to death on a lot of that stuff. So let's see. I'm awake. Everybody's awake. Good, good, good. Uh, Z, Roger snoozing. No, he's just kidding. Um, with instructions, yes, with instructions. Uh, so uh, let me just, if you don't, if we can take two seconds, deviate, uh, let me show you like the instructions, okay? So you get a PDF instructions uh, with step one, your job setup and a little description there. Step two, how to import the model file, the STL model, any one of the models, right? Uh, oops, step three, importing the vectors, because you got vectors for creating your uh, tool pass and also and things like that. Uh, step three, and, and both vectors for if, I don't know if uh, Blue Knight is with me tonight, but we have uh, in the vectors, you have SVG and DXF. For those of you that uh, can't in, import DXF files in your software, if you don't have Vectric. Uh, so you got SVG and DXF. Uh, and uh, you got step-by-step, step. so step four, you know, uh, creating the tool, you know, the tool pass, and then, you know, kind of a final project preview. Uh, but yes, you get photographs, everything you need on the setup. And then of course you can deviate, you can size the job up or down. Uh, you can uh, scale it, you know, but I recommend importing the model and the vectors at the full size that it says in this setup here in the instructions. Get those all imported because they're literally created to where when you import them, everything lays exactly where it's supposed to go in your project. All the vectors are aligned with the model and all that stuff. Once you get them all imported, then you can resize them up or down to meet your needs and all that stuff if you need to scale it to make it bigger, smaller, what have you. But I recommend importing it and getting all your vectors and your model imported at the full size. In this case, this project was... Um, 36 long by 12 inches wide by inch and a half thick. Uh, get it, create that job size, import those vectors and all, and then scale it up or down once everything is imported because it, everything is designed to lay in. Uh, if you import it in, you'll have to, uh, and you scaled before everything was imported, then you have to scale the other stuff to make it fit and line up properly and all that. And I don't recommend that. And I put that in the step number one, the rec that recommendation. So yeah, instructions, all kinds of cool stuff, right? Fun stuff to play around with. Um, all right. So models. Um, let's go back to our modeling tab here. Now, uh, I have created a video on splitting models. Uh, you'll see on the thumbnail in the Spindle TV channel. 
Uh, there's a bear that's split in half a bear's head and everything. So I'm not going to get into splitting or anything. I'm not going to get into all that advanced stuff at all. I'm just trying to focus on things that uh, all three Desktop Pro and Aspire can do uh, and everything with regards to clipping and, and things like that. But the most important thing, what most people struggle with that I've seen in my trainings, one-on-one -on -one trainings and all, is one, how to import a model. We're gonna do that right now. We're gonna import a model in. Uh, number two, uh, how to combine models, how they blend together. And number three, um, you know, the, uh, the levels and things. Uh, tool pathing, it's pretty almost kind of somewhat straightforward with tool pathing because you have a 3D rough cut and a 3D finish. You only have two tool paths to deal with. Uh, but uh, usually it's the importation, the combining, and the levels that give people a little bit of a hard time. And I'm hoping, I hope, that in this last hour and 45 minutes, um, yeah, last hour and 15, 45 minutes, uh, that the things that I showed you as far as the combined mode and the levels and how they interact with one another has been helpful to you. But now let's come in and open up Aspire, a blank Aspire here. And I'm gonna come in and I'm, I am gonna hold my shift key down and do this. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, in this case, I'll just go to an extremely high, but I'm going to uh, create a project and I'm gonna go 38 by 24 right now, just as a blank, uh, 38 by 24. Uh, I will, material surface is fine because I'm going to be doing a profile cut. Machine bed is good. I'm going to click OK. And now we're going to go into modeling and import the little folder here, import a 3D component. Now, when I import a third party model file, in this case, like an STL, Okay, uh, when I import a third party model file, uh, then I have to orientate that model, right? So let's go ahead and um, we'll import this United States flag real quick uh, from the 4th of July package. Now, most models from me are already orientated appropriately for a top orientation. However, Sometimes you might get models that come in sideways. They might come in upside down. They might come in left, right, whatever, all kind of funky orientations depending on how that creator created them and what plane he was in when he created that model and didn't realize he was not in an appropriate plane. And when he saved that STL and put it out on Etsy, you know, you get the model and it comes in like this. So we have to orientate the model appropriately. So in this case, it's a top orientation. Now, not all the, uh, like some models, um, if you say top, it might flip up like this because when that guy created it, in the plane that he was in, he might have been in his Y plane when he created it and all, and that actually made on his end this edge of the model, the top of the model, right? And so when we go top, if our model looks like this or whatever, we're like, oh wait, that's not right. So we might have to go to left or right or back or front to get that orientation we want. Now I'm good with you guys. The top orientation is the top orientation. That's what you want, right? So it comes in just like that. And now uh, I, if I had to, if I had to do any interactive rotation for whatever reason, maybe the model came in at a funky tilt, even at the top orientation, I can't quite get it right. Well, then I'm going to uh, come into my y, uh, Z view here. So I'm looking at it front on. And let's say that this model was still tilted 45 degrees. I might have to interactively rotate that model. So I have options for rotation up above here. I've got 180 degrees, I've got 90 degrees, positive and negative. But that doesn't help me if my model's skewed just a little bit when I imported it in, right? So now I have to physically orientate it. So I might have to interactively rotate it. In this case, if I interactively rotate the Y axis on the Y axis, when I uh, bring my mouse over and uh, tilt and things, 
on my Y, I am turning it kind of left and right. I'm almost turning it sideways, right? Depending on which way I go. So I might have to orientate it and kind of turn it a little bit to get it straightened out, right? In this case, that's not the case, right? This is a flat flag, so it's kind of, you know, uh, here. Okay, and what I want is I want a consistent blue all the way across here, just like that, so I know I'm flat. Now, I might have to rotate it along my X, so that's up and down here. So when I move my mouse up, I'm tilting the bottom out, right, and up. Uh, if I move the mouse down, I'm tilting the top out. So depending on this model, like I said, could be skewed in one direction or the other, and I have to physically get it back to where I want it, right? So I got to kind of move it up, move it up on that that X and everything until I get it flat again. Now, now that I'm flat, I want to um, come back just a little bit, and I want a consistent kind of blue all the way across, and I know I'm flat again, right? And on the Z, now the Z rotation is a little bit different. Uh, the Z rotation is uh, literally kind of uh, off of a Z point. I'm kind of pivoting off that point almost, if you will. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, kind of almost like a clockwise and a counterclockwise thing, right? Interactively rotating. So let's get that back down there. All right. And then I also have the option of X, Y, and Z. Basically, that's freehanding it, right? I'm not focusing on one. I'm not locking, you know, two other axes while I just rotate one or the other, which I find easier to do. I could just do total X, Y, Z. So wherever I move my mouse, I'm kind of freehanding it all the way around, right? Uh, and stuff like that. I very rarely use the whole XYZ. I usually kind of lock two planes while I rotate and fix one, and I work with one plane at a time if I have to interactively rotate that model. So that's what the interactive rotation is in our import orientation on our 3D models when we import a third-party model file. We very rarely have to deal with this. We, if, as a matter of fact, we don't have to deal with this with V3M models because they're vetric models and they come in already orientated properly. Um, so now outside of the orientation, now I have my model size, my model size. Now this is gonna come in at the model size, which it was uh, uh, 36 inches by 20 inch, 20.313 inches to be exact. Uh, and so the model was slightly smaller than that, which is 35 and a half by 19 and a little under, a little over five eighths. So what I wanna do is uh, this is the point in time where I would scale this model up or down as needed. Okay, uh, in this case, I don't need to scale it up or down. It's gonna fit on my 36 inch project and I'll wait to size it once I get it in there uh, if I don't wanna do it right here because I'm not sure what size project I wanna do right now, right? Uh, but if my project board would have been smaller, let's say it was 16 by eight and a half, then now's the time to scale that model so it fits on the project because once we click okay, whatever part of that model is not on our board when I click OK, it's only going to import Ha! It's going gonna, it's gonna to do me dirty. It imported the whole thing. Um, usually it will only import uh, the part of the model that's outside of that box. But it did me dirty. It was, uh, it was right. Uh, and also, look, I didn't, I didn't get the right tilt and everything there. So let's delete that out real quick. Dang, dumb it, you did me dirty, Patrick. Uh, in some cases, if it's outside of the area, it won't bring it in. Uh, let's go ahead and import a model again. We'll import that same model. And this time, where's it at? Right there. All right, for this, I'm simply going to, in the orientation, I don't need to orientate it. I don't need to rotate it. It's all fine. I'm going to center my model onto my board, and then I'm going to, when I say center now, it centered that model. So it split it in half and uh, everything, and to the top of the stars, the bottom model, it's, it's centered there. 
And now what I need to do is I need to bring that model above the zero plane. I need to bring the zero plane down to the bottom of the model. Uh, now, if your model, this is a tip, pro tip. If your model has a lot of waste material, like it's real thick when the person made it and there's a lot of meat behind it, now is the time, if you're working with thinner material, now is the time that you could thin out the herd, thin out the back of that, right? I could reduce that model down below my zero plane and then I have the box checked off here to discard any data that's below that zero plane, meaning get rid of it, and then I can bring my model in thinner. But you gotta be careful uh, because you know I have stripes and everything here and if my model is too low below that zero plane, and everything you'll see the colors the blue and the darker blue here uh, kind of more uh, the mauve if you will uh, that area is below the zero plane so if I said okay this is what I want to do here and I click OK then I'm only bringing in that top portion of those stripes and stuff um, and everything else that was mauve and below got removed and so that's all I get when I bring it in is this, right? So I was a little too low, right? So let's delete that and import it one last time. And this time we'll do it right. So you can thin out some of the back, but don't thin too much, right? Some of your model, don't let your model be. Uh, so center the model. I'm gonna lower the zero plane, meaning I'm gonna always slide that board down low so that my model's above the zero plane. And if we look at it, in a Y view, the side or X view, oh, that'll be fine. But you can see this kind of gray. Let's zoom in in my black background here. Um, <clears throat> you can see this line right here. That line, that's my zero plane. And this little slide bar indicates where my model falls within that zero plane. And I want it above it. I want it above it. So when I import that model, uh, it imports at its full thickness and uh, everything appropriately. So let it import. And there's our model. So that is uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of importing a model. And it's the same steps. Orientate your your uh, face, you know, where you need it, you know, your front, back, top, bottom, which way you need it to lay. Uh, rotate it if you have to freehand orientated if you have to get it sized down to fit your project and then make sure that it's a the part that you want to keep is above the zero plane uh, and all that now if it's a two-sided model right like it's a let's say it's a chess piece or something like that then you want to uh, when you import that model usually the software is pretty smart and it'll say hey I've detected a three-dimensional model all the way around do you want to import it as a flat model uh, do you want to import it as a round model uh, do you want to import or create both halves, both halves and all that stuff? And uh, you need to be set up on a two-sided job for that to occur, not a single-sided job. So you got to know what you're importing and stuff in. This is a single-sided project, but if this would have been a chess piece, round piece or whatever that I was going to carve on my table, I need to create a two-sided job for that, right? And then I'll get that option to create both halves, and it'll create both halves for me, my top half and my bottom half. All right, so we got our model orientated, right? Uh, and imported in now, from here we could, uh, I could throw some text, you know, I could come in here and throw some text and stuff and all in there. Now, I, if I was gonna write text on here, I'd wanna know uh, where to lay out this text, right? But if I click off my model of the grayscale, it goes away, it fades away, okay? And I really can't see where I'm putting my text unless I click on it to get kind of those that grayscale back, if you will. Well, I have a way to combat that. I can right click, uh, select it. I can right click and go down to Object Properties, and I can turn that fading off. Now, whether I'm clicked on that model or not, it is still showing me kind of that full grayscale. Uh, it's not faded, so I can see it. So now I could come in here and I could, you know, uh, come in and write in my uh, text, whatever it may be. Uh, let's go with a Arial Black and 
let's drag it in here and I want it to fall on that stripe there and I want to kind of be centered in that stripe so now I can see that stripe right so the light areas are the higher part that's the part I'm carving on the low areas are the bottom part those lower parts of the, the stripes and all so now I've got you know I've got the property fading turned off so whether I'm clicked on this model or not I can see it so I can do my layout and stuff of my V carve stuff that's going to happen on that and things like that uh, and everything so pretty cool stuff uh, by default uh, let's close this tool um, by default the object properties the fading is set to kind of like the midpoint right so when I click on it it's there when I'm not on it, it's there but again just select your model right click go to properties and turn that fading off if you need that grayscale to help you with your layout your vector drawing your text layout whatever it may be okay all right so let's answer a question and then we're going to kind of wrap up guys um uh kool-aid says does it matter the resolution you set when you input a model that was made in a lower or higher resolution and we talked about this kool-aid uh, you would popped in i'll thank you a little late uh and stuff um and uh but unfortunately you're kind of you're you're at the mercy of the quality of that model so if i set up a job in a high resolution and my job set up but i import a low quality model it's still a low quality model let's show you what a low quality model looks like let's go ahead and uh delete this one and uh we'll get rid of the u.s marines and let's go into my drawing and let's make sure I'm still set up at a high resolution, extremely high, good. Uh, now, I'm at extremely high resolution, which is about 8 million pixels, uh, which is really good. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't need to be the maximum, but I'm really good as far as resolution. So if I was building a model here, I'd be okay with building a model in the extremely high. I like building in the maximum, but I'd be okay with this. But now I'm gonna import a model. So uh, let's go in and import a model that's a low resolution model. And let's go into our downloads and let's scroll down to find a model that says scroll. Let me find the model name that says scroll. Bear with me a second. Great find dish scroll right here. Okay, scroll. Right. Here. All right. Now, on this model, let's go ahead and orientate it. See how it came in sideways, right? That's how the creator created it. Uh, let's orientate this. I want this to be. I'll do. Um, I will do front. There we go. And let's rotate it 90 degrees. There we go. Let's center that model and bring it up above our Z plane. Uh, let's reduce the Z height a little bit while we're here. Let's go uh, 1.5. Um, click apply. And uh, all right, so this model here has got a lot of base meat on the back end right uh, it's a very small model right now I've, I've sized it down just to get that inch and a half thick I've sized it down to four inches by 11 if I were to size this up bigger like I wanted let's say I wanted this to be on my y-axis let's say I wanted this to be uh, ten and a half then that brings my Z up to you know three and a three and eighth inch thick so here's what I'm gonna do uh, I'm gonna go into my Y view here, let's go uh, Y view this time so I can see the whole side here. And now on my zero plane, I'm gonna get it centered on my board. Okay, and I'm gonna look around this to make sure that all parts of my model are, that I, that you know, that make up the model are above the Z plane. There's none below that would really affect this at all. And I'm pretty content with that. So I've got the Z plane there. Let's come in here again. And I want to discard everything that's below that Z plane. And I want to click OK. 
And now I've, you know, I've got my scroll here and I've gotten rid of that base meat that was underneath and I'm at a decent height now. I can scale this up and kind of work with it a little bit more. All right, so here is a low quality model. When I can see the triangulation in the poly, uh, polygrams basically, uh, in, in that model, then it was created as a low poly model. So very low resolution. And no matter what, even if I try to smooth out this model, let it build up. Almost there. Okay. So if I try to smooth up this model, even taking it to its maximum, well, I don't want to go maximum. I don't want to lose all the detail in my leaves and things. Okay. So I'm almost at maximum, but I can, there is not a smooth turn on this. There's not a smooth, it's all, I can see the ridges of the triangulation and all of that stuff in there. And that is a low poly, low resolution model. And it's a model that I paid 11 bucks for and I wasted 11 bucks because uh, it's trash, right? So I would never use that model. Uh, and uh, now some, some, uh, some people like a CG trader, they will define it as a low poly model because these models that are created uh, from CG Trader and stuff, they're used in video games where the resolution doesn't have to be very high or the poly count doesn't have to be very high. They're using them in video games. They're using them in 3D renderings uh, for whatever, uh, you know, virtual worlds and all that stuff. So it really doesn't have to be that high of a resolution. But it actually says low poly scroll model or low this or low that. Well, this one didn't, right? It just says poly model, right? Or uh, poly scroll. Um, I don't think, let me look at the name again. Hold on a second. Did it say low poly? Bear with me. Let's go into import again and scroll down. Yeah, no, it just says upload filler scroll. So there was no, no, no low poly. There was nothing in the description, none of that because I wouldn't have bought it. Uh, and no matter what, I have all this triangulation and everything and that that's going to translate to the quality of my cut. My cut's going to look like that. And I absolutely, I, I want a nice smooth, you know, leaves and all that. I don't want that, all those triangulations and poly lines and stuff. And no matter how much smoothing I do, it's not going to improve. So uh, Kool-Aid, long story short, we're at the mercy of the model that we purchase or get in that resolution. And even though I'm in an extremely high resolution, I can't change the resolution of a model that someone created in a, you know, I can't, just because I imported it in that extremely high, it doesn't affect it, right? Now I'm gonna do my best for any models that I'm creating to work in that extremely high and things like that. And when I work with models, I still work with that extremely high and stuff. If I'm building models, I'm in the maximum generally. Um, but uh, for everyday use, at least the very high 7% slower, seven times slower in your job setup, which is kind of the standard default, at the very minimum, when you're working with a 3D model, that's where you should be. You should never be in standard or high. At the very minimum, we should be at very high. From there, go up. But unfortunately, you know, uh, I'm not gonna get a whole lot of great resolution out of that. Now. My models uh, that I create in clip art and all that stuff, because they are kind of part of Vetric, my model resolution when I import them in and stuff, uh, they're pretty much high resolution. They're pretty good. Uh, Vetric does a really good job with their model quality and everything uh, and stuff. So, um, but I still want to work in that very high resolution. Because if there's any pixelation in my model, because of not enough pixels to create it. I could have I could have the highest resolution model that I purchased and spent mega bucks on, and I could import it into a standard resolution, and it's gonna come in pixelated. And that pixelation is gonna translate to the quality of the finished cut. And it's gonna be a crappy cut, right? So I wanna work in a high resolution when I'm working with models, okay? 
All right. Okay. Okie dokie. I don't know, Kool-Aid, if that helps or helps or any of that stuff, but, uh, right. And Kool-Aid asks, could you fix that model or start from scratch? Yes. If I have a Spire, I could create this model from scratch, right? V-Carve does something pro, I can't, but from scratch, I could create it in a Spire, absolutely. Yes. Um, uh, Carl, uh, is there a way to tell what the quality of the model, uh, what the quality of model is that you're importing? No, usually it's the size of the file, right? The, the file size uh, plays a role uh, to let you know there's a lot of poly to that model and stuff. Um, and uh, let's look at that uh, really quickly here. So let's go into... our downloads and let's go down to our scroll model let's do it through vetric to make things easier on me um, come in here let's go down to our scroll there And this file size is 102 kilobytes, right? This scroll model, 102 kilobytes. Uh, and now let's go up to a model. Let's go to one of the 4th of July models here. Uh, and this object here, open up the properties. Come on now. Oh, what other properties? All right, let me uh, right click, go to properties. And this one is 28.4 megabytes. So 102 kilobytes versus 28.4 megabytes. Uh, big size difference in, in that higher resolution model. So that's one way to tell. Other than that, unless the description of the, the creator said, you know, this was created as a low poly model, Low poly is what it's typically referred to as a low poly model. Um, that would be the only, really the only two ways I know how to check it. Uh, file size uh, could be uh, and uh, an indication as well. Not the greatest indication, but an indication. Uh, in Aspire, can I fix that model? No. Uh, I mean, we could we could spend time trying to sculpt it and everything. If you are, if you are pretty good at uh, sculpting uh, and things like that, you could try to spend uh, hours cleaning this model up and all. But why would you waste that kind of time? I'd much rather if I have a spire. I'm not cleaning up somebody's crap work. I'm just going to build my own. Right? I'm going to find a vector of a scroll that I like, a vector. I'm going to import that vector and I'm going to build my shape off that vector in a high resolution. I'm going to be good. I don't want to have to come in here and, you know, uh, try to, let me twiddle the view to zoom in on it a bit. Okay. I don't want to have to come in here and try to you know, uh, clean things up and, you know, spend time. And no matter how much smoothing I do, let's smooth this whole top out here. No matter how much smoothing I do, I still have those steps all the way around, do, 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 all the way around. No matter how much smoothing I do, I still have those polylines. If I try to smear some of this or smudge some of this and kind of blend it and all, you know, kind of smear it around, you know, I might be able to kind of do that a little bit. I have to total my view and work my way around and all that. But why? Why? If we have a spire, build it. Build it from scratch and make it better, right? So, delete that. Or we could spend hours cleaning it up. But yes, you could. You could technically go for it. You could, so you could go for it. It's tedious, clean up, you know, smoothing. It's never going to be perfect, you know. You got to deal with what you got to deal with, and all. There's not enough polys there, poly, poly, poly lines, uh, poly, polygrams, 
poly angles, poly triangles, whatever. There's not enough polys there. So, Big Daddy Fish, uh, it would be, yeah, Dave Gatton has got it just right. Uh, garbage in, garbage out. So, uh, it, you could work on it, work on it, work on it. But, man, if you got a spire, build it, bad boy. Come in here, go into Google uh, and Google search scroll vector uh, let me see if it gives me the right kind of scroll <laughs> it's giving me like an actual scroll so let's go scroll flourish flourish vector okay and find a you know a flourish that or, or whatever that appeals to you uh in whatever you know uh fashion okay you can do all there's all different kinds there uh and give it a second to catch up Now, this one's a high resolution, but it's still blurry. I don't like that. I don't want it to be blurry. That just makes it harder for me. There we go, nice and crisp. All right, let's save that image. Save it. Come into here, let's get rid of that trash. Import that image. Okay. Now upon import, uh, you know, once I import it, now I could try just creating a model right from the image. Uh, it's called create a component from the selected or imported bitmap. I could do that uh, from here. And if I look at the 3D view, it's created right off the bat, this model here. Uh, and uh, I would reverse it, right? So let's go into here instead of an add mode I'm gonna make it a subtract so all the low stuff is high and all the high stuff is low uh, right and but even at that you know uh, I want I want some rounded tops and stuff and all I don't want flat right so creating it from the fit picture not gonna be good so what I want to do instead is I want to trace that image and get rid of the bitmap image. So I have this tracing vector now and I'll size it up to make it a little bit more larger. And now in my create shape tool in the modeling, drag that back up here, the create shape tool, uh, I want a dome shape I'd like to have a nice little, uh, possibly a 60 degree angle uh, on that dome. Uh, I'll give it a little bit of base height. I might want a little bit of base height, so I'll go an eighth of an inch. Uh, I want no limit on that dome. I'll decide if I want to flatten it off on the top a little bit. Uh, but right now I'm gonna go no limit and I'm gonna click apply. Okay, uh, in the 3D view, okay, so I've got this shape here and uh, I may want to, uh, I might not want it at 60. I may want to, let's say, let's go 30. Okay, because of these kind of puff pillows that are around here a little bit. Let's click apply. May want to reduce it down. I think a 45 would actually be decent. Uh, yeah, 30 is too low. Let's go 45 or 50. Let's go 45. Click apply here. Okay. Uh, so I have an option, you know, to go there. Uh, I could take the base height out of it so it's just all shape height. So I could come in here and take the base out of it so it's just all shape uh, and everything. Uh, and then I could come in if I wanted to define a little bit of a vein right there. I could do some sculpting and stuff in there. But in this case, I actually want to uh, create a little bit of a 
flat top with a, almost kind of a, a round over. So I'm actually going to go 90 degrees here on the dome, but I'm going to limit the height and uh, let's put my base height back in here. And on my height limit, I'm going to limit it to an eighth of an inch. Probably a sixteenth will look better. But what I'm doing is I'm kind of flattening off the top and creating this rounded over edge, right? Because I may want this flourish to have this look. I may want this to not have any limit. Okay, I may not want this to have any limit. I may want this flourish to have a bevel to it. Which doesn't look that great. Um, I may want to have it kind of, uh, uh, the edges kind of flow in uh, and everything. So where it kind of uh, uh, comes in and up and around and stuff. There's all kinds of different things I could do. Now this, all this looks ugly. Uh, I'm gonna go with just a straight dome. I'm gonna go 60 degrees, uh, 60 degrees. Yeah, 60 I'll go with. Eighth inch base, I'm gonna click OK, apply. And then what I'm gonna do is, you know, once I have this, uh, you know, this flourish here and everything, I'm actually gonna come over and do a little bit of smoothing. I don't need, I'm gonna actually just do a overall smoothing on this and let's kind of come in here. Uh, I'm just gonna click on the smoothing tool. I wanna preserve the transparency. So make sure that's checked. And then, once it's all settled, give it a second right here. Uh, then I can start to apply some smoothing. And what I'm wanting to do with this is I'm wanting to kind of uh, smooth out my edges and stuff. But you see my base edges right here? Uh, they're just kind of straight and flat. They don't look very attractive. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to close out of that uh, smoothing for a minute. And I'm going to add a draft. I'm going to add a draft to this model. And I'm going to go 30 degrees on the draft. Uh, that might be too extreme. Probably 15 would be subtle enough. But 30 degrees, I'm creating that nice draft angle coming out from the, uh, the straight side edges, the base meat. And then this is going to be it, guys. We're going to wrap up. So you see how automatically, guys, just by adding that draft, it makes it look 10 times better. Now I'm gonna come in here and I'm going to smooth, turn off this model because it created a whole new model with that draft, model with draft, so I can turn off the original. And now I'm gonna smooth all of this out. And smooth all that out. If I go too much, right, I start really smoothing it out, right? Uh, and also be careful on detail and stuff, how much smoothing and all you do. I kind of like staying within the front third here. I just want to smooth everything. Uh, and uh, now, you know, I've created this flourish. Pretty straightforward, simple. If I wanted to go in and add some detail to it, like some veins, I could do some smearing and stuff and sculpting and stuff. I could add some veinage in there uh, and everything uh, or whatever, or just as is. But it's much better than that scroll that I bought uh, that I would have had to spend hours on to clean. But, you know, if I come in here, let's say I want to do some sculpting on this. Uh, I'm going to twiddle the view first so I can turn it a little bit so I can see what I'm sculpting. And 
and you know I could come in here I could remove some material uh, I want to turn the power the strength down a little bit and I want to turn the diameter down really a bit and if I wanted to remove to kind of simulate a vein coming through here you know I could remove a little bit and kind of fade into nothing this there um, if I wanted to kind of smear some things around, smudge some things around, um, I could start to kind of uh, smudge this around a little bit uh, to open up this uh, little V heart shape right here a little bit. Uh, don't worry about this bulge that I'm creating over there. I'm basically, by smudging, I'm pulling material from one area to another. So that's what I'm doing when I'm smudging. I'm pulling area from one area to another. So pulling from one area to another. Okay. Um, now if I screw something up, I have an undo that I can come in here and just rub my mouse right over that and undo what I've done. Uh, and then once it's all said and done, I can come back and do a little bit of smoothing clean up my mess a little bit there uh, and everything uh, maybe want to remove a little bit of this vein right here again so open that up a little bit more in there and then come back and smooth some things out let's turn the smoothing down just a little bit and kind of smooth some things a little bit there and I could, you know, I could work that, right? I could add those things in and stuff. You know, I have that ability. But I'm working with my stuff that I created from, you know, uh, uh, my own shapes and all. And I'm not having to fix somebody's mess to try to get something close and all of that stuff. So if I have a spire, I'm building it if it's not a great quality. You know, if it's not great quality. Trash in, trash out. Dave Garbett said it best. Um, Dave Gatton. Why did I just say Dave Garber? That's one of my customers. Dave Gatton. Sorry, Dave. Sorry, buddy. Um, and all that good jazz, right? So that's what kind of Aspire does for us. And again, sculpting is an Aspire thing, guys and girls. We don't have that ability. We can smooth models. We do have the smoothing in Desktop and Pro uh, and all that, but uh, you know. So hopefully, with regards to how to import a model, how models merge and blend and tilt and fade and all that stuff together, what shape height is versus base height, how levels work or help you combine things that need to be combined. Hopefully all of this stuff, these little things that was a lot, quite a few hours of stuff to absorb, but hopefully some of that makes it a little bit easier to understand what's happening when you're working with your models. And maybe you get a little tidbit of something out of this class uh, tonight uh, but um, that is just some of the main kind of things clipping is great you know versus trimming and all that stuff and uh, and also um, hopefully you got uh, all of that stuff or something out of this all of this stuff that we went over we're gonna say you now we're gonna kind of uh, wrap up here and um, and all of that happy jazz Let's uh, let's end on a positive note. Delete that. Close out of here. And if you're at all um, interested, I do have that Fourth of July pack, which has. Um, models like this flag here with the and you're not going to see it right now you'll see it in about just a second just a second uh um uh got a u.s flag u.s flag with an eagle got a u.s uh flag with the 1776 union uh shaped like the united states all of that wonderful stuff and then i have a uh, that's our fourth of july pack and then i got a 2a pack which has uh you know a 1776 flag uh, basically has some text and stuff in it but uh, it's one project or it's multiple projects that you can pull components from um, but uh, you know 
the uh, bear with me a second here there we go we'll leave it at this screen uh, this particular frag project is available too and everything in that uh, 4th of July pack. Uh, basically, it's kind of the 1776 flag with the uh, constant, uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, a portion of it, not the whole thing, of course. Uh, and all that, uh, I'd love you to support me and uh, my venture to get another building uh, uh, so we can move into bigger and better things and full project builds. And I already got the idea for the first project I want to build, but guys, my guys, uh, some, one of my customers made a pretty cool cooler uh cabinet you know for like an igloo type cooler you know a wood cabinet uh like a for the deck and all that and i liked it uh you know i've seen them before and all but i really liked it i thought man uh something like that with some really nice decorative panels on it and stuff uh some inlay work would be awesome uh and uh, most of it i can do on the uh, cnc and then that cooler turned into an outside full-on uh summer kitchen build so that will probably be the first project is uh, we're gonna do some designs and some cabinets and everything and uh, build a summer kitchen, uh, outdoor summer kitchen, or at least at a minimum, the igloo cooler or something. But I've got some, I got a lot of projects I wanna work on, but we're gonna do full builds uh, along with full design and everything. So you're gonna get to see start to finish. Looking forward to that. Your support helps out a lot. The thumbs up, hit the thumbs up on this if you liked any of this content. Uh, subscribe if you're new to us. All that good jazz, everybody, that I never really say each week, but I'm kind of getting into it because I really want to start pumping things up. And um, again, email address, laney.shaughnessy. Is, it's in the chat. Uh, you can scroll up, uh, laney.shaughnessy at spindletv.com uh, with the subject line 4th of July package or 2A package. Whichever one you want, you'll get an invoice. They are $25 each. Uh, you can get one or the other or both. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, you have some pretty cool projects. There's quite, there's a lot in them. A lot in them for that little amount. All right, everybody. I really appreciate every you hanging with me for all these hours. We're going to say goodnight. Dave Gatton, thanks for popping in. And everybody, thanks for popping in. Thanks for your support last week and the money that we raised with your uh, purchasing of the Father's Day thing. I can't thank you enough because that all that, that you know, uh, I feel like if I would if I get a thousand downloads on that project before Father's Day, then I'll be good to go right at fifteen dollars a piece. But uh, we had uh, uh, I forget how many it was we raised about a thousand dollars of our fifteen thousand dollar goal. So uh, pretty cool there. All right, everybody, see ya. Enjoy your night, and I am gone. See ya. And Car Camaro. I know you're a cabinet expert on your machine and everything, so we can definitely talk. Absolutely. I'll hit you up on that. All right, everybody. See you later, guys. Hold on. I know I said bye, but I forgot. Email address is in the chat. See ya.